From a trip to the moon at the turn of the century to Apollo 13, movie audiences have always been captivated by spectacular special effects. Today, with the advent of computer technology, a digital renaissance is taking place in motion picture production. Join us as we celebrate 100 years of movie magic and visit famous monsters and towering infernos. Come with us as we go behind the scenes and meet award-winning visual effects directors as they bring gremlins to life. Blast off to the moon in Apollo 13 and travel into cyberspace in Lawnmower Man 2. Action on the dolly. Today, the art and science of creating motion pictures has changed dramatically. Cut. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so just sit like you're going to sit. You will not be getting up. So at the you push through. Push through. You look at him and you stand up. The capabilities of computer hardware and software have allowed filmmakers to create scenes that have never before been possible. With state-of-the-art digital techniques, perhaps the only limitation to what can be created on film is the director's imagination. In the beginning, the fact that pictures could move was magic enough. Snapshots were brought to life in these early scenes of everyday events. Entrepreneurs such as Thomas Edison realized they could bring entertainment to the masses with these simple films. The Lumiere brothers were the first to project a moving picture to the paying public. Their film, Arrival of a Train, is said to have caused the audiences to bound from their seats in shock at the approach of the train. One of the earliest films to use the camera for a special effect was The Execution of Mary, Queen of Scots. The queen kneels at the block and a life-size dummy replaces the actress. More than a few viewers marveled at the actress's sacrifice. The French magician cinematographer Georges Méliès is considered to be the father of special effects. Méliès realized the camera could be used to manipulate reality. In his most famous film, A Trip to the Moon, Méliès uses split screen, multiple exposures, and mechanical stage tricks to produce a humorous and innovative fantasy. deserves its place in history as the first science fiction film. In the early 1900s, movies seemed to have lost their popularity. Taking a cue from Méliès, filmmakers captured popular imagination by using a narrative, giving the movies a fresh lease on life. The Great Train Robbery consisted of scenes placed together to tell a story, with its non-theatrical sets and dramatic close-ups rather than stage props, gimmicks, or tricks, the audiences of the day were stunned. This early western made use of some of the first matte shots. In the mail car, the landscape can be seen through the open door. When the film of the landscape was shot, the set area was masked off. 
Then the film was rewound and the set area photographed with the door area masked off. The resulting film was a composite. By 1912, glass shots and miniatures were used to replace or add portions to a scene. Even the most famous of all movie sets, The Walls of Babylon, built for D.W. Griffith's intolerance, had cutouts and glass shots to increase the size and detail of the set. Large panes of glass were set between the camera and background, and miniatures were strategically placed. In the 20s, epics like Ben-Hur used miniatures hanging between the camera and full-scale sets to create the appearance of one single massive stadium. Fritz Lang's futuristic fantasy, Metropolis, impressively blended every tool available to the special effects teams. With the advent of sound, overnight, the fundamentals of filmmaking changed. The need to shoot on sound stages triggered the studios to develop their special effects departments in a systematic way. With pools of technical talent, the effects departments created many new techniques, leading in just a few short years to RKO Pictures' release in 1933 of King Kong. Kong was the logical extension of the films of Méliès, Griffith, and Lang. Live action combined with large-scale mechanical effects and Willis O'Brien's innovative stop-motion animation created a compelling sense of reality. Much of the background of this cave set scene has been painted on glass. Intricate miniature sets have been combined with previously photographed live action projected onto miniature screens camouflaged by rocks. Adding the 18-inch stop-motion calm creates a scene of astonishing realism. This film is as entertaining today as it was 60 years ago, and many of the techniques developed for King Kong are still used in today's modern epics. In the early days, we had seven major studios, and there were effects departments in all of them. Fortunately, at RKO, being the smallest studio, we did everything in the one department, and therefore I had the opportunity of learning uh, by working in all these categories. Since the studios closed, then naturally there had to be independent effects houses to handle all this work. And many of the fellows that worked in the studios opened up their own places like I did and carried on into the independent field. the effects department for the studios. We're like a little mini studio ourselves. We have all the various departments under one roof that uh, enable us to do visual effects from start to finish. If I walk around uh, the studio in my mind, you would have the art department, you'd have the production office, you'd have uh, the shooting stage, the model shop, uh, the matte painting department, you'd have uh, film processing, animation, optical, uh, editorial, of course, uh, projection, engineering, both electronic and mechanical. All these are various departments, and, and, and the, the beauty of having them all under one roof is there's a cross-pollinization that happens so that somebody from another department may even come up with an idea that, that will affect you. So it's, it's a great uh, sort of think tank approach to uh, creating sort of impossible images in a lot of cases. Sid is a really a talented person and peculiarly talented in, in terms of future think. He thinks in terms of how uh, designs will be uh, in the 
next century or you know and 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 he has a real good sense of that and he's a great designer on top of that so not only does he know how it will look but he knows how to make it look that way the rocket ships all those set designs were were done specifically to make the story more dramatic and more entertaining and more believable to a, a large audience Sid does not design every section and every piece. Uh, it's it's a feeling that he comes across, and then and so you need to have uh, basically an architect who can take that basic conceptual idea and 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 make it uh, work in all of the various details of the model. Models are used when uh, either the real article is not available or it's uh, it. For instance, in a spaceship, it doesn't exist, so you have to build it in a model. Um, for instance, back in the old days, when, uh, let's say they needed an ancient castle, obviously in Hollywood or, or Los Angeles, there, there are no castles, so they have to be built in miniature. At the turn of the century, models were used to present historical events to the public. The Battle of Manila Bay was recreated on a tiny set the size of a bathtub, using a number of simple special effects. Models were used by the studios to save costs in common everyday scenes or to create futuristic settings such as in the Buck Rogers serials. Miniatures also offer filmmakers a safer way of creating the costly destruction that audiences come to expect in Hollywood's action pictures. During Die Hard, they would not allow us to damage the Fox Plaza building. So we had to build miniatures of the Fox Plaza and then crash the helicopter off the top of it. With miniature pyrotechnics, you have to make everything burn much slower and still have enough power to destroy the, the device. Rolling and speed. The helicopter was ignited, then a computer was triggered, which lit the fire on the building, threw the helicopter off. We were basically hired to patch up problems they couldn't get in live action. Hollywood's full-scale action scenes create the appearance of high explosives with calculated precision. For the production of Demolition Man, special effects coordinator Joe Ramsey is responsible for the planning and execution of a number of scenes featuring pyrotechnics. And we know what our fires are going to do ahead of time. And the reason we know what they're going to do is what we've done before. We've done it before, we know what it's going to do, and uh, all your precautions, you know, all the safety is done up front. There's so many different types of fires. Uh, one type of fire would be, let's say, we'll start with the basics, propane type fires, where you're running controlled. I have a propane bottle, I have a hose, it goes to a propane bar. This is a slotted bar, now it's going to go ahead and get flame. I know it's only going to flame where I put these bars. It's only going to flame as high as I allow the propane bottle to go. The opening scene of Demolition Man involves a complex explosion using 13 cameras, two helicopters, and the destruction of an abandoned Department of Water and Power building in downtown Los Angeles. In this film here, we deal with a lot of explosions and fire and, and also very dangerous stunts, but I don't know, it's just something that I, I think that it, it's, if you can do it, it just adds a, a lot to the movie. Joel Silver, who's the producer on this show, said, Joe, I want a lot of fire, I love fire. I want a lot of fire on this building. Now, I can't have it mass the building though when the building falls and we said oh, okay so in talking with the rest of the group we went ahead and devised to what we thought was best and we did do some tests to where we changed harder pushes in certain areas lighter gas heavier gas in other areas we did so many tests on to how long a fireball would last and granted you're not doing it on the scale of that to where when you're, you're on such a big scale you know it's gonna you, you have variables it can last a little longer a little shorter but we thought we had it down to what was the right mount. 
Hollywood pyrotechnics create huge explosions by using slow-burning materials to give the blast shape and color for the cameras to photograph. Or we'll use gasoline or uh, naphthalene or benzol or hydro fire, diesel fuel. Each one gives you a different color. Some are red, some are red and yellow. Go to any alcohol and it's more of a blue. Let me mix it all, it depends on what the uh, director wants to see. We can give you a totally blue fireball, green fireball, red fireball. To create fireballs, a large steel pan called a mortar is used to shape the charge. If I wanted to make that fireball go wider and less high, I'd take and use a dish mortar, which would look like a big bowl. That would allow the fire to be thrown out. You gotta remember a bomb throws in 360 degrees, so what we're doing is directional in the bomb. What we're doing there is you notice that's a V mortar, it's directioning it up like that. So all the push is up and out. Uh, dish mortar would allow it to throw even further out. If I wanted to throw a fireball straight up, I'd use what they call a shotgun mortar. That would be basically a piece of pipe that would direction like a rifle barrel straight up. And here is a little three ounce black powder bomb. And uh, that's gonna be our lifter for the actual gas. That'll atomize it, lift it, spread it out. What he's tying in right now is a flash pack. That'll actually ignite the gasoline. Motion picture pyrotechnics are set off electrically using a 12 volt motorcycle battery. What I'm doing is tying in a button so I can set this off with just a button type. Three, two, one. For a fiery explosion, mortars with gasoline were set directly behind every window. The full-scale collapse of the structure was prepared by another group called Controlled Demolition International. The building explosion was uh probably the, one of the best explosions I've got to work on. And the reason being is was being tied in with the second company where you actually have the building drop afterwards. So we made the outsides heavy gas where they would continue to roll and burn. The inside we made quick bursts of gas so it burn, disappear, and uh, as you see in the film, when it disappears and clears, you get to see the whole building fall. That was a big shot, and it's only one time. So you're going, oh, come on. In action films, pyrotechnic shootouts are carefully choreographed. The safety of the actors and stuntmen is the first priority. In the early days of motion pictures, slingshots with marbles or ball bearings created the illusion of bullets striking objects. Slingshots with chalk left a puff of dust on impact, representing ricocheting bullets. Today's Hollywood shootouts use miniature charges known as squibs to create the illusion of bullet hits. Another faster method is the use of a small air gun to create bullets raking a scene. Okay, yeah. what's your, is that your gun hand? Yeah. Okay, here. We use this mainly so there's no wiring, it's uh, faster. It will spark as though a ricocheted bullet hit the car or metal or concrete. Classic horror characters continue to delight audiences. They are created from the imagination and ingenuity of Hollywood's special effects makeup artists. In the silent picture, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, starring John Barrymore, there was only ordinary stage makeup to help the actor define the transformation between Jekyll and Hyde. It was the actor's facial contortions and body movements that created Hyde's dark character.
Actor Lon Chaney's simple makeup box contained little more than grease paint and mortician's wax, but his mastery of the art of makeup led him to develop a number of extraordinary characters. One of Chaney's most famous characters was Quasimodo in Victor Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. It took Chaney three hours a day to apply the nose putty, plaster hump, and leather harness that kept him in a stooped position necessary for the character. Chaney's performance was a mastery of body gestures expressing emotions hidden under a thick layer of makeup. In 1924, Chaney began filming his most famous and memorable role, The Phantom of the Opera. In addition to his extraordinary makeup, Chaney knew that the placement of lights could either ruin or enhance his creation. He tested various makeup and lighting to determine the correct impact on screen. When the audience finally sees the Phantom unmasked and views him in all his horror, they are repelled. But as Cheney's character reacts to the knowledge of losing his love, he wins their sympathy. Universal Studios makeup artist Jack Pierce created Frankenstein, The Wolfman, and The Mummy, and inspired future generations. One of the youngest artists influenced by these pictures was Rob Bottin, who won an Academy Award for his work on Total Recall. Um, actually, I was a big uh, fan of monster movies since I was seven. And I always wondered, who were these guys that made these creatures? So I actually started uh, reading comic books and going to the library and trying to look up the history of makeup. So actually in one comic book I found out that there were a couple of guys that were still alive, one of which was Dick Smith who did The Exorcist. And I was a really big fan of his, you know. So uh, then they ran an article on his protege who was Rick Baker. And uh, uh, you know, I sent Rick a uh, picture that I had drawn when I was a kid and in exchange for his autograph. And Rick saw this picture and he said, I don't believe that a 14 year old kid can draw like this. So he had me brought out to his studio in North Hollywood and, and uh, he asked me if I wanted to work for him. Every monster that I make is uh, totally different. I really uh, just like to imagine things. You know, I'm a big daydreamer. It's rare that you'll actually see me. You know, people all say, God, you know, it, it, it's great what you do for a living. You know, you just sit there and you, you think. <laughs> you know, like, and, and that's what I do. You know, I just sit there and, and like I start daydreaming and thinking this stuff. And much like a writer, you know, would write, you know, you face the blank page. I sit and I think, well, let's see, what, what's this going to be like and why, you know. One of Rob's most original designs was for the cyborg in Robocop. The Robocop suit evolved into a stylized human form, which took about eight months to finalize. Total Recall, uh, of course, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, was a really, really neat opportunity again because I got to work with uh, Paul Verhoeven, the guy that directed Robocop. And um, Paul, you know, again said, do whatever you want, you know. And uh, one scene in particular, which I really like, is when Arnold is uh, trying to uh, escape the bad guys and he disguises himself as this big heavy set lady. What if he's got on like this futuristic mask? And what happens is the mask malfunctions. You know, they're questioning him and all of a sudden the mask malfunctions starts repeating the same thing over and over. And then all of a sudden the head opens up like, you know, Venetian blinds, you know, boom, 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 and reveals Arnold like that, 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 that. Paul says, well, can you do this? You like that? And I said, well, I don't know how to do it, but I mean, would that, wouldn't that be neat? Would you like that? And he goes, oh, certainly, this would be great. So he said, do it. So that's in the movie, and then, you know, that movie was the first time I won an Academy Award for my special effects. Another way creature creators bring movie monsters to life is stop-motion animation. In 1933, King Kong, the most famous monster of all time, was brought to life by Willis O'Brien. After half a century, this basic technique is still effectively used. On Ghostbusters, I was called in to see the Terror Dog characters. I redesigned them based on their concepts and then uh, sculpted uh, the miniature stop-motion puppet, which is a quarter scale. Uh, oversaw the uh, sculpting that Mike Hosh led of the larger full-size versions because they worked both as stop-motion puppets and as full-size on-set props. And then uh, actually did the animation 
of the uh, characters when they were running around and leaping and doing all that sort of thing. Stop motion is a process that utilizes the uniqueness of the movie making illusion where you uh, actually are seeing a series of still images projected in rapid succession to give the illusion of movement. With stop motion, you fool the mind by shooting a succession of still images in what you infer would be the uh, increments that they would appear had this character you're pushing around been moving in the real world, in real time. When you're ready to shoot the frame, you turn on the camera controller. It interlocks the camera and the projector. This character is photographed after the live action has been photographed. You shoot a frame of the uh, creature in conjunction with a single frame of movie film projected behind it. There are all sorts of ways uh, to bring creatures to life, of course. Stop motion is one of many. Puppetry is the art of manipulating characters. Today, with the use of computers, puppets are taking on a life of their own. Hello, everyone. I'm the big new star of the big new movie, Gremlins 2, the new batch. And here's someone very special to tell you all about it. The technology is evolving so quickly that um, the things that we're doing in this picture now, we couldn't have done six years ago in the other movie. Because the lip sync is so difficult to perform live and takes so many people, uh, and because Tony Randall talks so quickly in, in this film, uh, I decided that the best way to do that is to pre-program all the, all the lip sync dialogue and perform the rest of it live. Then you actually just program the upper lip first, and then the lower lip and the tongue and the jaw, each a separate pass. And then the Gilda Flute will play it back at the uh, at real time. Boy, this is a really good movie! And there you have it. A true unsolicited testimonial from Gizmo himself in his very own words. So listen to Gizmo. You know he'd never lie to anyone. <laughs> If a little gizmo or a gremlin is crawling along the floor, there's usually a hole in the floor. And so it's always a big question mark as to where this hole needs to be. So first we start out with a small hole, about three inches, and then later on at the end of the day or the end of this shooting of this particular sequence, the set will look like Swiss cheese because there's holes all over the place. They're not three inches, but they're this big. In the second movie, we had uh, already had the experience of doing the first movie, so we were much more prepared and knew pretty much what had been done before and what we wanted to do differently. It's in a sequel, you have to try to top the first picture. And there were a lot of things that were just not technically possible for us on the time and budget that we had in the first movie um, that we knew we would have to have in this picture. So when we went to Rick Baker, um, when we were writing the script, we tried to include him. They came to me before the script was even finished, and I said, you know, why don't we do this, why don't we do this, and this would be a really thing to try, you know, and they added that stuff in the script, and, and every day that we shot, we made up stuff, you know, Joe says, you know, what, what are we going to have him do today, you know, it's like, well, I don't know, what do you want him to do, he goes, well, you know, have him throw stuff, you know, I said, well, how about if we do this, and he goes, okay, so, you know, that's what was fun about working with Joe, he's real open for suggestion, to create a character, we'll start with a, a two-dimensional sketch, I usually do drawings first, and sometimes full-color paintings. We sculpt the new features, make molds of those parts. In, in those molds, we put rubber, which has to be baked in the oven, foam rubber usually. And it's painted, and you put hair on it, and, and the mechanics are built for it. It has facial hair mechanics. It really varies for each thing. I wouldn't exactly know how to tell somebody how to do this, and because on the surface, it just looks like you point the camera at it, and you, know, you turn it on, and you turn it off. But in fact, the number of puppeteers there are and the you know, amount of communication that has to go on to get even the simplest thing to happen when you want it um, is just something that comes with practice. Until the 1970s, the movies were still employing many of the same special effects techniques developed in the 1920s and 1930s. In 1975, George Lucas formed Industrial Light and Magic and took model photography and optical printing to new heights. John Dykstra orchestrated the spectacular motion control photography that used computers to move both the camera and models precisely. What we came up with is a way of controlling the camera and the subject relative to one another, basically recording the moves that each of those pieces make. And this became what we commonly refer to as motion control. Now, what 
this allows you to do when you're doing miniature photography is to lay down separate elements of film with different subject matter on them that are all matched together with the same move. This technique created the thrilling space battles the audience loved. This is the Star Wars optical printer right here. And this again is a camera. And it looks at a, a piece of film that's here and another piece of film that's here. And that's a lamp. And again, you re-photograph the uh, uh, you photograph uh, one piece of film and then you rewind the camera and you do a double exposure and you rewind the camera and you keep doing that endlessly to create this kind of picture. So in that picture like this, this background was uh, three pieces of film, a red, green, blue separation. These, each spaceship took seven pieces of film, so you got three, fourteen, and the engines were one piece of film each, fifteen, sixteen pieces of film, little separate pieces of film. The 1989 Academy Award winning picture, The Abyss, required all the visual effects tricks known to create an environment seemingly without effects. The effects teams combined radically different environments, water and air, to create the illusion of a futuristic adventure 2,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. Jim had done a, a film, his very first attempt at uh, shooting underwater. He said that uh, basically sets that were left underwater overnight were destroyed by the following morning. So it was determined very early on uh, that we would shoot uh, in some sort of tank. During the filming of the live action sequences, divers were submerged six to seven hours a day in underwater sets. Scenes too complicated to shoot underwater were filmed in miniature on dry stages. Jim Cameron was basically did most of the boarding, you know, along with John Bruno uh, for quite some time, came to DreamQuest along with other effects facilities uh, with the idea of breaking down the shots into specific categories or areas. And he came to DreamQuest with most of the uh, motion control type work. Boards were already complete, as if you can probably see some of we have up here. Essentially, what he wanted to do was find out our technique and ideas of how we would go about accomplishing the shots. So it did some thinking and uh, came up with some suggestions or ideas of new techniques that might allow the effects to look more realistic than probably could have been done with standard technology. And action, John. The director and effects teams built foam core mock-ups of the models and underwater sets to carefully choreograph and plan each scene as it would appear in the final film. Using videotape and stills of a cargo shipwreck 800 feet underwater as reference material, they returned to the stage to match the look of the abyss as closely as possible to reality. Okay, coming to the stop point. Now keep going, keep going. Okay. That's just a, to create a relationship. FX uh, 57 uh, is a shot where uh, Lindsay and the crew, the group, who are in the submersibles begin the reconnaissance and trying to find sunken submarine. Basically, what it is is a shot of, of three small submersibles going along the hull from the stern of the sub all the way to the bow of the broken nose of, of, of the sub. And again, it's being intercut with live action real footage of submersibles that they did in South Carolina in the big tank. What we did is we used the gantry um, system, the gantry motion control system, to hang the submersibles and then shot it using about six passes, some shot in smoke, some shot in clean air, and through the combination of the passes, filtration, and, and lighting, we were able to give the feeling that uh, we were shooting actually underwater. Most of the time, uh, when you're doing motion control work, you have separate film elements. In this case, having the actual models working in the same room, in the same environment, it allowed the lights from the submersibles, which were really the, really the only light source in the scene, to actually illuminate the background, which in this case was the sunken uh, Montana. When we started the abyss, we looked at using traditional techniques. In other words, shooting the subs against uh, a blue screen and compositing them into a background, in this case a Trident submarine. The advantage the gantry system gave us was that we were able to do everything pretty much in camera. We, we spent the extra time to build this enormous rig and it took much longer to program because instead of maybe uh, 8 or 12 axes of movement, suddenly we had 32 going all at once, all three submarines and uh, in addition to the camera moves and any other little uh, gags we had going on at the time. 
The models on the particular part of the gantry were kind of special in the sense that they had to be self-contained. In other words, the submersibles had to have their own power sources, they had to contain the rear projectors, and they were quite large. Dave Goldberg was in charge of actually designing and coming up with a lot of solutions in constructing the models. A rear projection system was used within the submersibles to give the illusion of the actor actually being inside the craft piloting it. The film was shot of the actors in a full-size set prior to our shooting the miniatures and then used in a projector that was built and put inside the models. The finished illusion would be that even though you were looking at a miniature, you would be seeing live action people inside of it. The scenes are shot in separate passes in order to control exposure and color of each element. Using the technology of motion control, the effects teams duplicate the movements of each model perfectly for the final composite. The light from the miniature subs in smoke makes up one pass. Another pass in clean air uses fill light in order to see the details of the models. The image of Lindsay is rear projected into the cockpit of the miniatures in a separate pass. The final composite is made up of these and other elements, including a pass for strobe lights and bubbles, which add to the underwater look of the scene. The sequence is where Lindsay's outside of the, the broken, damaged deep core, and she's on, literally on the edge of the abyss standing there, and she senses this colorful light, and this huge type of ship, kind of glass ship, comes up. And so it's made up of a number of cuts. And the first one is, of course, is a wide angle shot where we see Lindsay and some of the wreckage in the edge of the abyss as we see the match ship rise up and over the edge. That was done dry for wet. In other words, Lindsay, who was actually a stunt person shot uh, months later uh, at Harbor Star in San Pedro, was shot against a blue screen uh, in air. We then cut to a close up where we're down low looking up as the Manta wing kind of passes over top and she reaches up and actually touches the surface. This one we're close enough that the bubbles and her regulator and just the whole way that the uh, water moves and the bubbles come off the top of the Manta ship required us to shoot it underwater. In order to give the illusion that her bubbles were coming in, in contact with the surface of the Manta ship, what we did is we hung plexiglass mirrors in the water at the plane of which the wing would actually coincide. These are the finished boards of the pseudopod sequence, which were the scenes exactly as we would have liked to see them. Looking these over, you know, we sat down one day and said, well, they can't be done. Uh, not by any means that, that I know of or other than computer graphics, but we were really nervous about CGI basically because at that time, CGI still, it still looked plastic. The first photorealistic computer-generated graphics were produced by ILM for the film Young Sherlock Holmes. A computer created a stained glass night not possible with any other effects technique. For the abyss, CGI would need to be pushed beyond its known limits. Here we were asking it to do water. So we talked about all these other ways. One was replacement animation of acrylic pieces. But the, with the, the length of the shots required, we thought that would be insane. At this point, Dennis Muren of Industrial Light and Magic suggested Alias Research Computer Animation System to produce the pseudopod. Those tests showed uh, some possibilities, but initially it looked a little chrome and still a little plastic, but it looked like it was possible at least to get all the motion that we needed. And then we figured if it didn't work, which, which a lot of us were not really positive, that we would just cut the sequence shorter or we would light it dark. The scene required an alien probe made of seawater to float in mid-air as it encounters a crew of humans. The effect was so difficult that it could not have been done by any other means than computer-generated imaging. Bud, 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 get up. 
The evolution of digital technology has provided filmmakers with the opportunity to attempt projects never before possible. To have contemporary pop star Paula Abdul perform with legendary dancer Gene Kelly would have been impossible without computers. The challenge for R. Greenberg and Associates was to provide an interaction between the two dancers and match the original camera moves. We've gone to great lengths to figure out the uh, lens information that was used on the old um, footage and things like that so that we can match things as, as closely as possible. The intention is to create seamless choreography between the 40s and the 90s. For lighting and shadowing, reference material was filmed using a stand-in for Gene Kelly to help determine where the shadows should fall and move. The first step is to isolate and pull Gene Kelly's image from the original background. A mat or cutout is created and tested for fit. Gene is then placed into the scene with Paula. Adjustments are made in color, movement and lighting. Once completed, the elements are combined into the finished piece. The thought of dancing with Gene Kelly and Groucho and being able to be in the scene with Cary Grant. Who, who wouldn't love to be in a situation like that? These are heroes of mine. Record and music. With this commercial, everything is a matter of seconds and I have to hit certain marks, like tape marks, because of the motion control camera or, or because of the icons I don't want to cross over. and You have to work everything out. There's just one, and there's no mistake in it, one. Just no fake in it, one. Why don't you and me do some fancy stuff in the night? Oh, we got two, two styling, just for feeling, just for taste. No, the mommy found it, just while we're something to hand it. Call the taste, you know this job. And there's just one, and there's no mistake in it, one. For Terminator 2, visionary director James Cameron and industrial light and magic again push the boundaries of special effects with the creation of the advanced shape-shifting T-1000. The T-1000 was a liquid metal killing machine with the ability to change its form. A computerized morphing technique was employed to digitally transform the T-1000 in a single uninterrupted shot. A live action shot of the actor was digitized and a computer model was split open digitally then the software program automatically closed up the severed facial features. The next breakthrough in CGI came in the creation of the living creatures of Steven Spielberg's Jurassic Park. First, the background plate for the computer-generated T-Rex was shot on a set. The dinosaur was introduced into the scene and animated in wireframe form. The background plate was scanned into the computer and composited with the wireframe model. The fully rendered T-Rex was a collaboration between special effects, artistry, and science. Cinesight Digital Film Center is creating all of the digital imaging for Lawnmower Man 2. Cinesight and Allied Entertainment are producing these ambitious cyberspace sequences using computer graphic animation blended with live action to create images that exist only in the filmmaker's imagination. Digital effects is using computer software or computer hardware to create or manipulate images that already exist. Let's take uh, maybe a script that takes place in the 1920s or the 1930s, okay? And you really want to recreate Times Square in New York. It's very costly to do that now, but you, there is so much historical footage of Times Square in the 1930s that you could take that footage, you can clean it up, colorize it, contemporize it, and put it into your film. So when you have scripts now that are talking about uh, 
you know, faraway lands or locations that you can't go to or might not exist or characters that can't be fabricated by any other means. You can put them all together and create them in a computer using digital technology. So really, there are no boundaries anymore. Digital technologies originally developed for industrial use are being introduced into the entertainment industry. Viewpoint Data Labs produces a three-dimensional catalog of digital models. The human form is always the very best. Uh, to take a picture of you would, would be ideal. And this technology is basically only, only going to be used when either the person is dead or when the person, you know, something unusual needs to happen. It's always been very difficult to try, and, to try and digitize the human face. And so this is one way, using lasers and mirrors, that that, that can be achieved. So we foresee the, uh, the cyberware as just playing a, a companion role. And as, more, as technology becomes greater and more and more stars uh, want to spend less and less time in front of the screen, or they, the creative minds come up with new things for actors to do. Um, that can't be done with, traditionally, an actor can't blow his own head up, but we'll be able to do that with the data that's, that's, uh, that's provided by this machine. Everyone's so excited about the technology, which is great, you know, but it's really uh, an after effect of our, our primary goals, which is doing uh, good, good entertainment. I mean, that's, that's what's really going to sell, and, and uh, we're trying to do it digitally. We're trying to do digital cartoons and digital movies. We're able to take a, an actor with all his talents, his or her talents, of uh, portraying dramatic scenarios and record their motion very succinctly into the computer, in fact, at 100 frames per second. As you can see, there's sensors all over the body here um, that are being read vis-a-vis uh, -vis a, a large magnetic uh, a standing wave that's being created by a magnet under the floor. And the sensors are strategically placed on points in the body that uh, are joint, basically joint points um, for uh, mechanical relationships of body motion. You have complete uh, articulation in the fingers. There's 22 sensors that are being read in real time as well. And um, that goes back into a, a, a normal PC at this point and then uh, gets networked into a silicon graphics machine, which will display it in real time. Then at that point, you really, the, the world is wide open. You can superimpose any database you want. It could be a, a cartoon character or a very realistic character, you know, Donald Duck or the skeleton, which is what we did. Digital Domain, a full-service effects studio, was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects for the film True Lies. For Ron Howard's Apollo 13, Digital Domain combined large-scale miniatures, CGI, and live-action photography to achieve photorealistic effects using state-of-the-art digital technology. It's very exciting because I think it's, it's very liberating as a as a director, um, you can shoot uh, you can shoot part of a scene. You can augment it later. You can change your mind and rework it. Almost in a way, you're able to edit within the image, within the shot. For the first time, you can edit within a shot, and that's never been possible before. I mean, the issue of whether we'll see Arnold Schwarzenegger starring in movies 500 years from now, I think very possibly. You know, I mean, I think that it would be possible say within the next 10 years, to, to store his image and his voice in, in three-dimensional data and to, to animate it later. Yeah, he, he may still be around a thousand years from now. Even the best special effect is only as good as the actor's reaction to it. So if you have a, a really great effect and, an, and, a, and a, you cut to an actor who doesn't look like he's believing what he sees, then your effect is no good. When you create reality, they call it special effects. And it's not an effect, really. When you get through, it's reality. If you don't think it's reality, it's not a good job. 
I think that uh, visual effect will continue to expand, and uh, as long as they continue to satisfy the audience's desire to be put in a place they couldn't otherwise possibly be put, they will continue to be successful. Mm -hmm.